Hi everyone and welcome to our very first DDC 360 webinar. As it's our first, I ask that you bear with us. This is us crafting our trade in the art of communication as well as selling paint. So look, the first, uh, first and foremost, the reason for us doing this is all of us uh, are working our way through a crisis that none of us have seen before. And with that crisis comes many challenges, lots of ambiguity, huge amounts of anxiety, I'm sure, for many of you uh, running your own businesses, and hopefully a bright new future ahead of us. So we thought we'd get together as a business and we connect with some of our customers, contractors and specifiers over the coming weeks and months to ensure that we all learn um, as an industry. Hopefully we share ideas, we learn from those ideas and we become fitter and more agile to face into what I hope are many, many more opportunities for all of us. So in this first webinar, I'm really delighted to be joined by two fantastic guests. Firstly, we've got John Waterman, the COO, so Chief Operating Officer from Wilmot Dixon, a huge construction company who I'm sure faced many, many challenges as a result of the COVID crisis. And then secondly, we've got Kevin Orme, who is Head of Facilities Management for Care UK. And Care UK are one of the largest providers to the NHS. So really dealing with some of those challenges that they're facing on the front line and, and we ourselves, and I'm sure many of you have, have also had to face in. So look, before we hand over to our two guests and hear what they have to say about their sectors, uh, I'd like to introduce our interviewer, Mr. Ollie Partington, our sales director for Julep's Decorator Centres. Ollie, welcome. And Ollie, look, it would be wrong of me not to use this as an opportunity to fire a couple of questions in your direction, given that you're also in the hot seat now as well. In terms of DDC, just for a minute, um, obviously a challenge to, to keep 240 stores running and servicing our customers. And I know we've had several iterations of that over the past uh, few months to try and land on a sweet spot of keeping our customers happy and well serviced, but also whilst protecting our employees, which is obviously absolutely paramount for a business of this size. Just give me a few examples of what we've had to put in place in order to keep the DDCs up and running. I mean, just to, just to go back a step, um, in, in the DDCs, in our stores, we, we employ over 1,300 people, uh, 1,300 store colleagues in a retail environment. So to have to adapt to the changes that COVID-19 forced upon us was was a, a massive challenge for us to overcome. And after a really testing first week for, for everybody that operated uh, in retail, we were able to adapt and put in place a hub structure for 15 stores to allow us to deliver to essential projects for DDC 360 customers. It gave us a little bit of time to, to stop and to think. And in that time, we, we've spent our time from then to, to now to think about how we develop our service proposition and how we improve how we can support our customers so in that time we've put in place a call and collect process a click and collect process we've looked at reopening stores in a safe manner as we've moved along please say at this point at this moment in time we're, we're over 200 stores that are operational um, both click and collect call and collect and deliveries and we're still looking at how we're going to move forward because i think what is obvious to, to all of us, and it will come through loud and clear from our, our guest speakers today, I'm sure, is that things will not go back to normal straight away. So our focus from an operational perspective is how do we continue to adapt and how do we continue to grow? But the basis of, of our business is our people and our customers. So it's how do we deliver the best possible service, but in a safe manner, both for our colleagues and for our customers. Yeah. And uh, obviously, we've witnessed some of those challenges. And I think, uh, you know, for all of us in business, you know, ourselves, but I'm sure many of the customers who are watching this, having to make some fairly tough decisions um, in terms of not knowing what's right or wrong, but having to feel our way forward at many times. But it sounds as though mm -hmm. now we've got into a, a cadence and uh, a way of servicing our customers and balancing that with also protecting our, our own employees. And it would be great if you could just share some of the highlights as well. So obviously, or I hope there have been some highlights over the past uh, few weeks. I'm fairly sure there have because I've heard of some myself. But if you could share some, that would be great. 
Yeah, it's um, it's not all been doom and gloom. I think, if anything, this period has been a timely reminder for all of us of the impact that our industry can have. If we specifically talk about the NHS, um, we've been able to support over 50 different projects alongside our contractors and actually offer um, Stereoshield um, over £80,000 worth of Stereoshield free of charge directly to the NHS. Um, and it's not just us that are doing that. Um, our contractors in a lot of instances are offering labour free of charge as well. So that's been a real highlight for me because it's been just that reminder of just the impact that we can make. And I'd probably also just point out to the fact that as we've put in place a lot of these operational changes, it's not all been smooth sailing. And there have been asks of our customers um, while we've been doing this to work with us and support us. You know, a notable example I'd use is the £100 minimum order value that we put in place, which we've now been able to, to take out. Um, we've asked our customers to, to work with us. And in the vast majority of cases, um, it's been brilliant how our customers have supported us, supported our stores, they've supported their clients. And, and it's really felt like as an industry, we've come together to, to get through this, uh, this crisis. I suppose now I'm going to hand over to you um, to introduce our two guests. Uh, customers. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, hopefully that that gives a decent overview of of what we've been doing as a business, both as a as a manufacturer and also within within our stores. So probably a good point to bring our guest speakers into the conversation. And to get us started, I'd like to introduce uh, John Waterman. So, John, firstly, massive thank you for taking the time out to speak to us today. Um, we've taken a couple of questions in advance of, of this interview from a couple of our customers, which I'm going to use to help us as a guide in the next 10 minutes or so. So I'll do my best, Michael Parkinson, as I go through these. Um, probably a good place to, to kick off, a good question we got through to start with, is what have been the biggest things that have had to change about on-site working practices in order to enable Wilmot Dixon to reopen safely? Quite a lot. Um, difficult to sort of uh, start in any priority, but obviously um, the priority is keeping people safe, and which means keeping people at a distance. Um, and um, that has involved us really um, kind of looking from the whole infrastructure of the sites. So everything from the way people move around the sites, um, use staircases, um, corridors, um, or if those aren't in place, how people get around the sites. So it's introduced um, one-way systems, which we've never seen before. We've seen them in transportation, but, but not for people. Um, we've, we've had to uh, expand our welfare facilities so we can use our canteens and our toilets um, by, whilst keeping a, a safe distance. Um, so that kind of thing is probably the sort of bread and butter of, of making a, a, a project safe. So entry and, and egress from the site is, is well controlled as well. Um, we make sure that we um, all of our people entering the sites um, uh, can uh, can sanitize their hands coming in and out of the sites. So all of that kind of stuff of, of making sites feel safe in operation. Probably one of the biggest significant changes is the way we've had to approach approach the activities on site. Um, so I hate to say it, but but I think that construction is very much driven by um, numbers of uh, uh, people on site um, to produce output um, and what what we've kind of moved towards is a much more planned careful controlled approach to our activities where we're we're looking ahead um, because we have to make sure that the 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 the, um, the activities can happen safely but also safely at a distance so that we can make sure we can do the jobs that we're about to do or the, or the activity Activities that we're about to do whilst maintaining a safe distance. So that's put a lot more emphasis on planning um, the activities well beforehand. Um, and it's also kind of made us think about um, 
optimum numbers of people to do tasks as opposed to traditional um, we need 20 people to do that or we need 10 or we need whatever um, it's more about um, what's the task what's the optimum number of people that we can have doing that task safely and what that's made us is not only safer more controlled but but more efficient in the tasks that we do um, which is why I say that we're moving from a kind of a numbers perspective to a productivity perspective um, and I see that changing um, more and more as we go ahead um, other interesting things that I picked up going to site myself um, I see that the the respect that we have for each other and our supply chains is is far greater than than I've seen it before. So we respect each other's safe safety in in far deeper ways than I've seen before. Um, and obviously, other changes have been around shift work, extending days, working weekends, where we haven't been able to get the productivity during the week. So they're, they're probably the most significant changes. I guess when you've been going out to site um, <clears throat> and the subcontractors and, and your site teams that you've been interacting with, what are the main concerns coming from them? Um, I think the main concern is, do I feel safe? And that's me, our supply chain, our partners, um, our, our managers, the, the overriding feeling is do I feel safe in this environment and, and I think we put a lot of attention into as I've, as I've already mentioned um, gate, uh, gatekeepers that control ent entry and egress or ingress and egress um, sanitizing um, hands before we before we enter site sanitize um, sanitizing cleaning stations around the site marks to make sure that we keep our two meter dif distance um, controls of how we get in and out of our welfare facilities without brushing past each other all those one-way systems i've talked about it's all about i feel safe i feel like um our business the business i'm, I'm working for in this case wilmot dixon care about my welfare and therefore i will respect the environment that i'm in and in, in the safe environment that we've created so as, yeah, so just repeating what I've said, the overriding feeling from everybody, customers, supply chain, and our own managers is, do I feel safe in this environment? Great. Um, I suppose a, a key question that's come from quite a few of our, our customers um, is that they're sort of thinking about how they scale their businesses back up when they bring people back off furlough. Um, and a question that's come from quite a few is, what, what changes do they need to consider to get themselves onto the front foot. So as they start returning back onto some of your sites and, and other construction sites across the UK, what are the key things that they need to be thinking about to get themselves on the front foot? Um, I, think, I think I would say that um, the first thing has to be to accommodate the changes that they see on the sites. Um, so if they haven't been part of that already, um, so the social distancing and the and the respect for each other and and the things I've, I've talked about, it, it's making sure that that they 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 and their people that they're sending to sites have an open mindset to to the new environment that that is now for for Wilmot Dixon is business as usual now. Um, so resisting that 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 will will cause problems for the people around them and them as, a, as businesses. So first and foremost, be prepared to accept the changes that they see on the sites and support them. Um, that's probably first and, first and foremost. The second thing is, is from, from our perspective, I think is to try and look at our activities um, in a different light. So looking at it from a productivity perspective rather than a, um, you know, a number of people perspective based on empirical calculations that we've been working for from years and years and years. So this is about how can I achieve my task in the most optimum way with the, with the, with the fewest number of people in the most productive way. 
So it's changing our thinking, as I said earlier, um, from six painters, six people, whatever, um, to what's the optimum number. And one of the things I would say, particularly for to, to decorators, having been in the industry myself a long time, we have a habit of starting things too early. We have a habit of working over each other. We have a habit of just trying to get stuff done as opposed to managing it in a very ordered, efficient, sequential way where we can be effective and efficient. So I would say to, to any, any supply chain partner, um, be more diligent with, are you ready for me? Can I do it effectively? Can I do it efficiently? And can I do it um, without interruption of other trades? Um, that for us is working for us. Um, getting, uh, one of the things I've seen our supply chain do is challenge our own decision making much more than they used to um, and be part of the solution rather than take orders from, from our management. Does that make sense? I remember um, hearing uh, a fact a couple of years ago, and it might not still be the case, but it was, um, it was just quite an impactful one about construction in the UK. It said in a lot of instances, on average, a building is built one and a half times because of um, ineffectivity. And, uh, and I think quite a few decorators in particular get that, where um, everyone's on site at the same time. And I think some of them are looking at this with a positive outlook for the future, that if it then becomes around productivity and um, and focusing on on a proper time plan a little bit better that actually it, it works out they can be more productive and actually they can be they can be cheaper for their uh, for the main contractor as well yeah absolutely through through our sort of change program that we've been doing for the number a number of years i think we are slowly realizing that um, a better controlled site is a more efficient site which is a more profitable site for our for our um for our supply chain um and we're not all sort of squabbling over territory if you like um as i say it's really important that, that we teach our own leaders and managers that a sign of a busy site is not loads of people working on top of each other a sign of a busy site is a site that's well run with with everybody being productive and I think that's going to be a significant change, certainly for us and, and what I'm hearing in the marketplace. I suppose just um, <clears throat> a lot of questions we got through were, were what I would call uh, crystal ball questions, um, which is uh, looking forward to the future, which is, I think, difficult for everybody at the moment. But I suppose what, what are you guys an anticipating is, is the impact going to be for, for you as a business over the next sort of six to 12 months? Um. So immediately for us, uh, you know, we work on a, uh, a pipeline that takes anything from a year to two years to, to bring to site. Um, so through planning, design and, and that kind of thing. So um, the initial impact that we will see is jobs or projects, sorry, that may not actually happen. Um, so in the last sort of few months we've seen a few projects shelved um, particular sectors are immediately struggling struggling so higher education is struggling for you know overseas um, students and that kind of thing so um, that's probably the immediate impact it hasn't been signif significant yet um, but it has been it has affected us um, other things that we're starting to see is our customers are starting to say, well, you know, whatever kind of um, recession we may or may not see, um, customers are saying, well, we'd like to see some benefit from that now. So there's some challenges on pricing already. Um, so more competitive is, is probably um, uh, a more competitive environment is already starting to sort of bubble up. Um, in the long term or medium to long term, I see certain sectors will struggle. Um, so probably commercial office space um, is going to be challenging as, uh, as many, many businesses will start to realize that maybe we don't need such big offices. Maybe we can work from home a bit more. 
travel less. So those sectors will suffer. Um, those that will probably will, will, will fire on ahead of things like social housing, um, health, health care, extra care, are probably sectors that um, will grow in the future. We're probably growing before COVID-19 are probably you know, going to sort of see a surge. I think the government will, they've already made a statement that they will um, prefer to invest um, through this crisis or after this crisis than see austerity measures. So it's very likely that we will see more focus on public spend. Yeah. Um, so from, so from Wilmot Dixon's perspective, that's good news for us because most of our, our work is, is probably in the public sector. Brilliant. I think it's interesting to see that um, that difference between public sector and, and private sector, because I know there, there has been a lot of question marks about austerity um, and what's going to happen with spending. But I think after years of um, restriction, uh, it, it does feel like that's where there's going to be a degree of, of protection over the next couple of months, which I think is a, is a positive message out of it all. 100%. Um, I think, uh, you know, what we're hearing from... Um, from government and from our customers is is uh, definitely a push forward, you know, an optimism, um, a resistance to, to 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 sort of shelve projects, but to you know the opposite to just keep keep them going. So, yeah, I think I think um, yeah, what I'm hearing is is um, is reason to be cautiously optimistic, really. Um, which I think is, I think that's brilliant. It's a great message for us to to play back out as well, because I think in in, a, in amongst all the uncertainty, there are there are shoots of of optimism out there. I think in a new build and in a maintenance environment, and um, you know there's there's still a basic need for healthcare, um, social housing, for public sector, and for spend to be there. So while that's there, I think there's obviously always a need for for the trades that we operate in. Um, and I think it's just, it's been brilliant actually talking to you about some of the key things that I think are quite useful for um, guys that operate in our industry to take out. I think particularly that um, that shift from numbers equals output into actually it's got to be a focus on, on productivity um, because there's going to be that balance, isn't there, on there's only so many people you can have on site, but you still want to keep a, a strong output um, and the productivity is a really core cool part of it. Yeah. Um, I think likewise, probably a strong message all the way through your supply chain, um, two points that you said quite early on around um, that respect for one another on site. And I think from that, you build the trust and the ask of people going into that environment is you have an open mindset and it helps grow respect and trust in one another. And that's how you help people overcome any fears that are there. Absolutely. Yeah, 100%. Brilliant. Brilliant. Well, John, just want to thank you uh, again for your time. Um, really appreciate you you taking the time out to talk to us today. Some really, really useful stuff there. That I think uh, I think will help all of us plan what we uh, what we want to do over the next couple of months. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you very much, and yeah, stay safe and um, look after yourself. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Some really useful insight uh, and a lot of food for thought for our painting subcontractors as they start to scale up in a new build environment. Construction has obviously been a hot topic in the media over the past few months and an area where guidance from the government has been circulated to quite a broad audience. But it's really important for us to note that across our decorating industry as a whole, the majority of application still happens in established buildings. So I'm really pleased that we've been joined today as well by Kevin Orm, who, as Alistair mentioned, is the FM Director for Care UK. So, Kevin, thank you again for your time. Obviously, your business and your team have been significantly impacted by COVID-19. Um, I think it's probably fair to say it's been a, a really incredible, challenging period over the last um, two months across the health um, and social care sector. Um, not only have we been trying to look after the um, safety and health of our residents, but also their mental well-being as well. So the homes have worked really, really hard to keep the residents safe. Um, but they've also worked really, really hard as well, just to make sure the residents can carry on enjoying life as much as possible um, within the confines of the home. 
um, particularly for me uh, and the FM team, um, probably the biggest challenge we've had is deciding what maintenance services we should carry on providing at the moment, um, which services should stop, um, and really at what point we can get back to a normality. But I think it's the same with everybody. What, what was normal three months ago, um, I don't think will be the normal um, ever, I guess, because um, normality is going to change. Um, in terms of my, my team, um, we, we have still been quite busy. Um, as you'd imagine, we've still had to provide uh, reactive works to our care homes for things like heating, hot water, um, you know, key essential services that are broken down. Um, we've also carried on with statutory maintenance where we've had to. Um, but perhaps the biggest challenge um, is organising safe access into the homes, um, agreeing dynamic risk assessments, agreeing appropriate levels of PPE for contractors, um, and obviously there are areas of the home where we've not been able to get into at all because those areas are in quarantine. And I think when it comes on to lessons learned, um, we'll be seeing the impact of that for some time. I think contacting the homes and organising access communication has been key and that will continue as well. Um, I think communication is a, a vital part of trying to get out of this process or out of this pandemic. Um, and having the right contractor available um, with the right operative has also been difficult because like all contractors, um, some of the um, contracting staff have been um, self-isolating due to their, their, their particular circumstances. Um, and we've had obviously quite a lot of the um, sector, construction sector, furloughing staff. So we, we have lost some really, really good contractors in terms of availability to tap into, tap into their support. In terms of um, lessons learned then um, for my team, uh, for KUK and, and perhaps the sector, the wider sector, I mean, certainly having an in-house help desk has really helped. And um, we've got the technology whereby everybody can work from home. And it's been really, really good how quickly we've mobilised that. I guess like a lot of companies that have had to move from a central office location um, to home working, um, technology is key. We did find stopping uh, non-essential maintenance work very easy, um, just, just saying, you know, put this work on hold. But, but what's been incredibly difficult is agreeing with our stakeholders how and when um, work should recommence. Mm. I don't really see that happening um, over the next few weeks, but I'm hoping the next couple of months we can start getting back access back into the homes to carry on the work that we, we left off back in um, March. Uh, Clear and timely communications with the homes and supply chain is key, as I mentioned. Um, we're very fortunate that we've had a um, central CAFM system where all of our orders are raised. So although we've put a lot of work on hold, at least we know the state of play, where the work was, what's on hold with which contractor at which home. So that's been really, really good. Um, perhaps the biggest challenge when we've had to go into the homes, and it will be a challenge going forward, is segregating contractors from the rest of the building users. Um, and I'm hoping as time goes on, uh, where we do start to pick up redecoration programs, for example, that we can hand over perhaps an empty wing um, to a contractor so that we can totally keep the contractors and our care home staff from registered separate. Uh, and perhaps um, dynamic risk assessments and method statements, whilst they're always really important, I think with COVID, um, that, 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 that importance has uh, continued and has been um, more important than ever before. Um, so in terms of perhaps what the new normal look like, um, I think it's likely that the whole sector um, will have a phased approach in terms of lifting access restrictions. Um, it won't be um, at the same time scales as the general population because care homes are obviously very, very vulnerable, got a lot of vulnerable residents in there. So what I wouldn't expect um, from a construction industry is that you're going to get lots and lots of requests for work um, or get the green light to restart pause work all in one go. I think you'll find that it will be phased, um, which in some respects hopefully will, will help um, contractors um, because I, I know a lot of you have still got um, guys on furlough. I think health and safety, and in particular, the risk assessments and method statements, as I mentioned, will become even more important and absolutely, definitely will need to consider infection control um, more than they have done before. I think inevitably um, there will be much more stringent infection control procedures required of you when you go into health and social care environments. And at the moment for COVID, for example, anybody going into our home um, has temperature checks. There is restricted access to parts of the home 
um, PPE is required for all of our contractors. And at the moment that includes face masks. Um, so a, a type 2R, which is um, a, a moisture repellent um, and hand washing, sanitation, um, change of clothing at the end of the day is really important as well. One of the things we try to avoid is a contractor coming in to do work within our home and then going down the road to another home the same day with the same um, clothing on, um, because obviously we don't want to um, transmit um, anything from one home to another. Um, and, and obviously, if you're working in a care home where, the, where there might be COVID, um, it's probably sensible that you have a change of clothes before you go back into your own home as well. Um, ideally, complete separation of contractors from staff and residents would be great. Um, and if we can do that, as I mentioned before, about um, perhaps giving up unoccupied wings for maintenance and repair, that would be good. Um, I think probably the, the, one of the big issues that's affecting all of us will be around cash flow. So, so I know cash flow for all businesses will be a major, major challenge. Um, I suppose for the care industry itself, um, I mean, apart from the terrible loss of life over the last two, three months, and possibly what's going to go on for the next uh, month or two. For the care home sector, um, over a period of two months, we've lost at least £6 million pounds a week um, in lost fees. And obviously that's had a massive, massive impact um, on the business. Um, so, so cash will be tight. Um, and what will tend to happen is that we'll, we'll focus the monies we've got on, on frontline services, which basically means there's always a, an interesting challenge for the FM team who have got to deliver um, other services. I guess from a personal view, um, I think probably frontline staff and families that's lost, lost loved ones during the pandemic um, are going to need an awful lot of help and support for some time to come. Um, another area within the care sector is many of our frontline staff, um, like NHS staff, are on minimum wage and recruitment across the sector it is tough normally, um, but I think that will get tougher, tougher and tougher as time goes on. So one benefit, hopefully, um, off the back of this will be a significant increase in frontline staff salaries, which will be a real positive thing. Um, but as I mentioned before, there's only a certain amount of money within a business. So if money goes on frontline salary increases, that means we have got less to spend on, on maintenance and repairs. Um, I think it's probably also going to be harder to attract residents into care homes in the future, um, certainly in the near future, as there's probably an unfair but understandable view that perhaps they're not safe places to be. That certainly isn't the case, um, but obviously with the news of all the deaths in care homes, um, it, it paints a, a particularly um, a poor picture. Um, I suppose linked with that, though, is the condition of the environment. So finishes, decor, furniture, flooring, wall coverings, etc. They all or they all present a very positive impression. So I'm hoping that will, in turn, increase uh, money spent on maintenance activity. Um, I think though the FM team, certainly my team, will be expected to deliver more into the homes from a maintenance point of view, possibly with less funding, um, because there will be pressure on um, investment elsewhere within the business. Perhaps, um, I think from a wider property team point of view, not just facilities, but across the wider um, property um, portfolio, we will be looking for the construction sector to come to us with innovation. So what we haven't looked at in the past, to be fair, are perhaps finishes that help us combat um, uh, the spread of viruses. Um, so we definitely will be looking at that in a lot more detail. Um, the inevitably, there's going to be a backlog of work. Um, so at some time, that need time that we'll need picking up. Um, I think probably, though, with the pressure on budgets uh, and everything else that's going on um, across the sector, I think it's probably going to be about another two to three years before we get back to a, a normal level of spend on building fabric. Um, probably longer term, um, uh, by 2040, um, the, the, the age uh, dependency ratio, which, which is basically um, the number of um, people requiring um, support, um, out of um, a thousand people of working age, that's going to set to increase in 2040 from 282 out of 1,000 to 368. So, so we have got an aging population. So the, the positive point of that is that in the longer term, um, demand for care homes and bed spaces will increase. And inevitably, the amount of money that we spend in the industry on maintenance and repairs will increase. I mean, that is another sort of 10, 20 years off um, but longer term, I think the positive is an awful lot brighter. Um, expenditure on repairs and maintenance uh, will have to um, increase as well because of the condition of the building fabric. As I mentioned across the industry, there's an awful lot of older building stock. Um, but for the newer homes with uh, leasehold um, 
uh, obligations uh, like Care UK, um, there will be a requirement to um, follow the obligations under the lease. So I can see an awful lot of painting and decorating being done across our portfolio just to meet lease obligations. Um, that's probably it for me. Um, so, um, you know, thank you for the time for listening and um, stay safe. Now, Kevin, thanks. Thanks a lot for your time today. Uh, I guess just want to acknowledge on a on a personal level, it must be must have been a really testing time for for you and for your teams and the environments that you that you operate in. So you know, I think you should be proud of of everything that you've been able to do over this period. And um, we really appreciate your your input today. because It's quite um, it's quite eye opening. And I think there is. You know there is obviously going to be tough times ahead but there is positivity in that um i guess maintenance is is always going to need to happen um, yeah. but it's going to need to happen in a in a different way um i think there were some really useful points there i think for for us as a, a supply chain partner but also for contractors that work with you as well around the the importance of communication um the heightened focus on ppe risk assessments um and infection control which are things that these people haven't been used to before yeah and i think the last the last one is something that i think is relevant for for all of us uh, across all industries around innovation that reality is, is things are gonna um are not gonna go back to a normal like you said for maybe two two to three years and in that time um there's there's probably an ask on on everybody to innovate how we how we do our jobs or the products that we provide to help support our uh, our partners uh, across all sorts of different industries. Yeah, absolutely. And so as you've been talking there, Ollie, I realised the bit that I missed from that uh, presentation is that we've still got quite a healthy new build program. So looking forward to 2040, um, we probably build about five six new care homes every year, and we have been doing that for the last six or seven years. And we've got a program that goes on for the next two or three years at the, at the very, very least. So we are investing um, in new homes. Um, and obviously, from a new build point of view, that's really, really good. A brilliant way to end on a positive note. Thanks very much, Kevin. Thanks. I just wanted to again thank Kevin and John for their time today. It's been some really brilliant insight, which I know is going to help all of us adapt in what is clearly a, a changing environment and a number of changes that are going to stay with us for the foreseeable future. What we wanted to do next was just come back to some of the questions that we had through from our customers in advance of today's webinar that were more specific to myself and Alistair. We're not going to be able to answer every single question that we got today. So if we haven't answered your question, um, we will come back to you individually. Likewise, for those that have been asking questions live throughout today's webinar, we'll come back to you on an individual basis following the webinar. So firstly, um, a question has come in. Obviously, through these challenging times, many of our customers now are going to be feeling the pinch and concerned about the future. So there's a whole question that's come in around, how can you support me as a customer financially? What can we do in that space? So it's a really good question. I think for all businesses at the moment, uh, cash is king now more than ever. And I suppose it's, it's how you cope with the current lockdown. And it's also then how you start scaling your business back up again. Um, what I would just encourage everybody to do, you know, we, we stand by our customers. And if anybody out there is, is struggling financially, we just encourage you to reach out and talk to us. Um, we, we will do what we can to support our customer base. So if you do have any queries or any challenges, just pick up the phone and talk to your account manager um, and we can talk through any options that we've, that we've got to support you. Okay, great. Thank you. And yeah, that's really key at this moment in time. Yeah. Uh, real value in just picking up the phone and having a conversation. So second question. Um, so a number of uh, customers as part of DDC 360 fall into what we term contract partners and a question has come in in terms of what's happening to contract partnership because it feels as though it's been up in the air for some time yeah so I suppose just for for those that have uh, dialed into the, the webinar that don't know what uh, contract partnership is in, in a nutshell it's our, our third party run accreditation scheme uh, it's also the scheme that we use as a, a platform to drive a, a better ingrained business to business relationship with uh, with our key contract partners um, it's we've been reviewing it for probably the past 18 months and we had been in a place where we were going to relaunch a new concept in june this year 
for obvious reasons, we're not going to be able to do that in June. Uh, we are still planning on doing this at the back end of the year, looking at an October launch time. So I would just uh, I would just say watch this space, probably hear more about it in the next couple of months. Okay, brilliant. So I think probably the, the third question here, Alistair, is, is more relevant to you. And um, this question comes through from, from a couple of contractors, actually. And uh, it's, it's about a worry about continuity of supply. So the question is, how are you going to keep product on the shelf? Yeah, so I touched on it earlier in terms of some of the challenges that we face. And just to, just to put it into perspective, our business has transformed over the last three months in terms of how we're servicing customers. So in our factories, which are running full tilt, as you're aware, 24-7 um, at the moment, churning paint out, there's 27 million households all locked up at home wanting to decorate. So it's caused a huge surge in demand. And just to put some of that demand into perspective, for our Coupinol brand, demand is 300% of what it was at the same time last year. Um, in terms of how we service our customers, and this is across the broader business now, our e-commerce business has gone from roughly 50 orders a day up to 10,000 orders a day. So it's put huge pressure on the business. But if some of the people who are listening saying, so what, that doesn't impact me and how do I get my paint? Well, all the paint comes from the same factories. Um, and um, we've got a very complex model in order to ensure that the paint is sold through the right place at the right time. Despite all of the challenges that we've got in place, um, we've really ramped up the shift, shifts in the, in the factories. Um, we have what we call a forecasting plan. So every week our teams meet um, and they discuss the forecast for the next six to 12 months, day by day to understand what the orders are that are coming in versus what needs to go out. What I'd ask for is the more cooperation that we can get from our customers, the more chance we have of delivering everything as and when it's required. We're getting better, believe me, three or four weeks ago, it really was painful. So we are getting better, but we're not out of the woods yet because there's such a huge spike in, in what the UK is calling for at the moment. So I'd just like to take this opportunity really to thank anybody who struggled to stop for their patience. Um, apologies for that. Hopefully you understand why that is with a lot of the measures we've had to put in place around the crisis. Uh, and rest assured, we're doing absolutely everything possible to uh, to get back to our normal service levels which are 96 97 percent of orders which is which is extremely high generally thanks a lot for that alistair and i think that recurring theme of positivity and sharing positive messages is is really important i think what came through loud and clear uh, today from both of our guest speakers is yes there's going to be significant change and there's an ask of all of us to innovate and adapt as we work our way through the next couple of months and adapt to our new norm. But actually out the other side of that, there, there is grounds for optimism, both commercially and also in how we're coming together as an industry and how we're coming together um, with our customers and all the way through the supply chain. So on that note, I'll, I'll bring today's webinar to an end. Hopefully everybody has found it, uh, found it useful. Our intention is, is that we will do more of these. Uh, we'll continue to share insight and information from, from all the different sectors and the different customers that we interact with, and just to make sure that as we navigate through the next couple of months and also the next couple of years, that we do so together as an industry. Thank you very much.